Last week, the U.S. reached its credit limit of $31.5 trillion. The government cannot legally borrow any more money. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is now warning of a U.S. default if a new limit isn't set soon, and the U.S. isn't the only country in trouble. Today, I'm going to explain why governments are at risk of defaulting on their debts, tell you what this means for the markets, and reveal why the worst is yet to come. Most governments make their money from taxes and fees. In theory, this money is supposed to be used for stuff like public infrastructure, such as roads, and public institutions, such as schools. In practice, this money goes on military spending and buying votes with lots of benefits. Not only that, but most governments spend a lot more money than they bring in from tax and fee revenues. To make up the difference, governments issue debt in the form of bonds. A government bond is basically an IOU. Give me money today and I'll pay you back later with interest. Now, the repayment date in question depends on the duration of the bond. Bond durations range from one month to 30 years or more, and bonds are generally considered to be the safest investment you can make. That's simply because governments make their money by effectively taking it from citizens, which means that you're guaranteed to get paid back with the interest that's been promised at the end of the bond term. The interest rates on government bonds depend on factors such as the duration of the bond, the risks associated with the government issuing it, the economic conditions of the country or region where the government is based, and the buying and selling of market participants. Logically, the longer the duration of a bond, the higher the interest rate. That's because investors need to be compensated for the opportunity cost of not being able to spend that money. That's why the yield curve showing interest rates on all durations of government bonds normally goes up and to the right. Naturally, Countries considered to be high risk tend to offer higher interest rates on their bonds, regardless of duration. That's because investors need to be compensated for the additional risk they're taking on. After all, there's less of a guarantee that a country in crisis can pay them back. Now, economic conditions are where things get interesting. When a country's economy is struggling, interest rates on shorter-term government debt are higher than the interest rates on longer-term government debt. It's investors saying, I'm not so confident that you can pay me back in the short term for whatever reason. When shorter term interest rates on government bonds are higher than longer term interest rates on said bonds, this is called a yield curve inversion, and the economic signal it sends is why it's associated with a recession. Note that the yield curve is the most inverted it's been in over 40 years. This leaves the final and most significant factor, and that's buying and selling by market participants. And by market participants, I mean everyone. Individuals, institutions, foreign individuals and institutions, and even foreign and domestic central banks. In general, interest rates on government bonds go up when they're being sold, i.e. when the prices of government bonds are going down. Conversely, interest rates on government bonds go down when they're being bought, i.e. when the prices of government bonds are going up. Now, if you're wondering where the central banks fit in, the answer is the shortest term interest rate. Believe it or not, but central bank rate hikes and cuts only affect the overnight interest rates on loans between commercial banks. This might not sound like much, but it affects the entire yield curve, all the rates. Here's where things get wild. When governments have too much debt, they often introduce regulations to force domestic investors to buy government bonds to keep interest rates low. In extreme cases, the central bank itself will begin actively buying government bonds to keep rates low, called monetary financing. Almost every country has been doing something along these lines for decades. That's because Almost every country is up to its eyeballs in debt that it can't pay back. As such, allowing interest rates to rise would result in a government default, an inability to pay the money and interest rates owed to bondholders. Now, it's important to note that a government default doesn't happen overnight. What typically happens 
is that a government starts allocating more and more of its revenue from taxes and fees to paying off bondholders until there's little to no money left to spend on public infrastructure or institutions. This becomes a sort of death spiral because an inability to spend on public infrastructure and institutions usually means the economy will suffer, which lowers tax revenue. That's why most governments will simultaneously do what Japan is currently doing, buying up bonds to keep interest rates low. The issue with this approach is that it quickly devalues the national currency of the country in question. This is because the central bank uses newly created money to buy up all the bonds. An increase in supply with the same or less demand means that the value of the asset goes down. In Japan's case, the yen has been collapsing in value against other currencies because the Bank of Japan, or BOJ, has been aggressively printing yen to buy up government bonds to keep interest rates low. To put things into perspective, Japan's debt is more than twice the size of its entire economy. So, if the BOJ allowed interest rates to rise, then the country would default on its debts. However, continuing to buy bonds to keep interest rates low means that the yen will eventually go to zero. Not ideal. But luckily, the BOJ has two options it can tap for temporary relief. The first is to sell foreign assets to buy Japanese yen to ensure that the currency doesn't collapse. Funnily enough, the BOJ is the largest holder of US government bonds outside of the US. This means the BOJ can sell US bonds to buy US dollars, to buy yen, to buy Japanese bonds without completely crashing the yen. And this is exactly what the BOJ has been doing. According to data from the US Treasury Department, the BOJ has sold almost $200 billion of US bonds since November 2021, reportedly to protect the yen. And the BOJ still has over $1 trillion of US bonds left. However, you'll recall that when market participants sell large amounts of government bonds, it causes interest rates for that government to go up. This means that the BOJ's selling of US bonds is essentially exporting its high interest rate pressures to the US. That's a problem because the US has big debts too. Now, this ties into the BOJ's second option, and that's to ask an international lender of last resort, like the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, for a dollar-denominated loan. Instead of selling US bonds for US dollars to buy yen, the BOJ can ask the IMF for a US dollar loan and use those US dollars to buy yen. The problem there is that IMF loans come with lots of conditions, and usually these conditions involve changing laws for the benefit of the US and its allies. The IMF also doesn't have the billions of dollars needed to fully bail out an advanced economy like Japan. At best, it can only provide temporary aid. This means that Japan can only delay the inevitability that either the yen will go to zero or that the government will default on its debt. Historically, governments sacrifice their national currencies to protect themselves, but it begs the question of what happens when governments default. The answer is that the government may issue new durations of debt, change the terms on existing durations of debt, or convince bondholders to accept a smaller repayment. And yes, a country can recover from a default. Greece, Lebanon, and Syria have all defaulted in recent years and still exist. But the defaulting country gets downgraded, making it harder to find bond buyers and interest rates on new bonds soar. The consequences of a debt default would be particularly severe for the US for many reasons. For starters, the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, and US bonds are the safest asset for investors. The US also has the largest amount of debt in global percentage terms and dollar terms. Once upon a time, the US Department of the Treasury had to ask for approval from politicians every time it wanted to borrow money by issuing bonds. This changed in 1917 when the debt ceiling was introduced to allow the Treasury to borrow more because of the First World War. As the name suggests, the debt ceiling sets a limit on how much money the US government can borrow. The rationale 
is that it forces the US government to be more careful with how much money it spends, because reaching the debt limit would mean that it must rely only on taxes and fees to operate. As with all limits imposed by politicians, the US debt ceiling has been raised over 100 times since the early 1900s, the last time being in December 2021. This raised the borrowing limit to around $31.5 trillion, and this limit was hit last week. This is actually a pretty big deal. Now, hitting the debt ceiling isn't the same as a debt default. As I mentioned earlier, it means that the US government can only continue to operate on taxes and fees. As you'll remember, though, the US government has been operating at a deficit, which means it has limited funds. According to Janet Yellen, the US government only has enough money to make it to June. This is when the Treasury will have to take even more, quote, extraordinary measures. This is code for pausing spending on public infrastructure and institutions to continue paying bondholders. By now you'll know that pausing spending on public infrastructure and institutions risks creating a death spiral where the economy suffers, meaning less revenue from taxes and fees. So far, the Treasury has paused allocation to some pension funds. But, come June, it could pause paying government employees. Whether the Treasury will resort to such extraordinary measures ultimately depends on whether US politicians can agree on raising the debt ceiling before the actual do-or-die deadline. Obviously, disagreement about raising the debt ceiling is why last week's initial deadline was missed. The TLDR is that Republicans want the current administration to cut government spending, the Democrats want to continue increasing said spending, and the recent US midterm elections have given the Republicans enough power to block a debt ceiling raise indefinitely. This kind of high-stakes debt ceiling standoff has happened before. The last time was over 10 years ago, and the outcome wasn't ideal. After months of intense back and forth, politicians agreed to raise the debt ceiling at the 11th hour in early August 2011. Now, the outcome of the 2011 debt ceiling crisis was a 17% crash in the stock market and US government debt being downgraded for the first time in history. Now, some analysts believe the current debt ceiling standoff will result in a similarly bad set of outcomes, but it looks like it could be much, much worse. Besides the fact that the US government has a lot more debt and expenses than it did back in 2011, political polarization in the country is at an all-time high. This means that it's going to be extremely difficult for opposing politicians to come to consensus, and some would rather let it all burn. More importantly, the Treasury may run out of money sooner than June. This is partly because the Fed will likely raise interest rates again, and partly because countries like Japan are being forced to sell US bonds for dollars to buy their own currencies to buy their own bonds, further raising US interest rates. Now, I'm no macro expert, but I'm pretty sure this means that the Treasury will be hit with a double whammy. Less revenue from taxes and fees because high interest rates are crashing the US economy, and more expenses because the interest owed to US bondholders has gone up, also because of higher rates. The end result is less runway for the Treasury, which is probably why President Biden is focusing his efforts on getting a deal to raise the debt ceiling approved by mid-April at the latest, as per CNBC. Make no mistake, if that April deal doesn't go through, the markets could crash by a lot more than 17%. At this point, the Fed would probably lower interest rates to give the Treasury more breathing room. If that's not enough, then the Fed could start buying US bonds to keep interest rates low, like the BOJ is doing. This would be truly unprecedented, but it's arguably inevitable for every country. Unlike the BOJ, the Fed would only have one option to protect the purchasing power of the US dollar, selling off foreign assets for US dollars to buy US bonds. But the Fed doesn't have many foreign assets. The IMF wouldn't be an option either because the US is just too big. This leaves China, which has become an international lender of last resort in recent years. 
Now, the idea that the US would tap China for foreign aid is unfathomable, but China would be one of the few countries that would be capable of purchasing enough US bonds to keep interest rates low. Unfortunately for the US, the seizure of the assets of Russia's central bank means that China would not be very keen on accumulating US bonds in an emergency situation, even with favorable terms. In fact, it's another reason why China and other countries have been selling lots of US bonds lately. Now, as provoking as this hypothetical outcome is, it's unlikely to occur anytime soon. This is mainly because almost every other country is in much worse shape than the US as far as debt burdens go, even with the debt ceiling standoff. Dozens are on the brink of default, and this could be by design. If you're confused, take a second to consider what effects the Fed's rate hikes have been having on the global economy. The US dollar is the world's reserve currency, meaning it's used for international trade. It also means most foreign countries have dollar-denominated debts. Now, the interest rates on dollar-denominated debts are, of course, influenced by interest rates on US government bonds, and these rates have been rising. This has sent countries scrambling to get their hands on the dollars they need to pay the additional interest on their more expensive debts. This is a big part of why currencies were collapsing against the US dollar late last year. Many countries had no other option but to sell their currencies to buy dollars to pay their debts, causing their currencies to crash. Some countries didn't have this ability, and this forced them to turn to the IMF for US dollars. The result was a record high level of IMF bailouts, with over 40 loans being given out last autumn. The IMF went on to warn that the worst was yet to come. Meanwhile, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva was shaking hands with the leaders of troubled countries, knowing that the contracts had been signed. You might remember that these IMF loans come with lots of conditions, which force these countries to comply with the US and its allies. When you realize that a bipolar world is forming, it looks like the Fed is intentionally pushing these countries to the brink of default to make sure they end up on Team America. And as an added bonus, countries that lean on the IMF are likely to start accumulating US bonds. This could be a condition of their debt deals or because those appointed to key institutions are suddenly pro-USA. This buying pressure could help keep the lid on interest rates in the US. And this seems to be more than speculation because lots of macro analysts such as Brent Johnson have underscored the fact that the US dollar has been weaponized for political purposes. This means that the Fed could keep interest rates higher for longer, even if inflation comes down and unemployment rises. For context, the Fed's dual mandate is to ensure inflation hovers at around 2% and that unemployment remains steady at around 4%. However, many have argued that the Fed has an unofficial third mandate, and that's to ensure that the US dollar remains the world's reserve currency at all costs. Given that US supremacy is now being challenged by China, it would make sense for the Fed to find every excuse to maximize demand for US dollars around the world by raising interest rates and keeping them high. The plot twist is that the IMF isn't the only international lender of last resort anymore. In case you forgot, China has recently become an international lender of last resort. It has no shortage of dollars on the balance sheet that it wants to get rid of, dollars that these countries desperately need. As it so happens, China is the second largest holder of US bonds with nearly $900 billion worth on hand. Now, the difference between China and the IMF is that China frequently requires that countries provide physical infrastructure as collateral for their loans. When the loans aren't paid back, China takes possession of key airports, seaports, highways, you name it. With control of key infrastructure, China gets the leverage it needs to force these countries to come to it the next time they're short on dollars instead of the IMF or other US-affiliated lenders. Maybe next time, the loan will be in Chinese yuan instead of US dollars. Maybe it'll be in digital yuan. Speculation aside, 
The main takeaway here is that we are in the middle of a de facto financial war between superpowers, and it is therefore unwise to see interest rates and debt defaults in a vacuum. I may not know the specifics of what's coming, but I know for sure that it's going to be absolutely crazy. Thank <laughs> you.